Hello everyone, me and Pedro are going to talk to you about the agricultural development and the agricultural transformation and the rural development. Hi guys. To start with, I'll present to you some key facts about the agricultural situation in the world. All 3.5 billion people live in the rural areas and it's estimated that one quarter of them live in extreme poverty. 50% uh, of the population of Latin America and Asia, they also live in rural areas. And it is considered that in Sub-Saharan Africa, 60% of the population live in the countryside. As we have been discussing in the tutorial today, uh, agriculture has always been conceived at one sector that would provide labor and cheap food to the industrial sector that was always considered uh, the sector that would promote the growth of the country. However, however, economists came to realize that it is necessary an integrated rural development that would allow to the increase of the productivity of smaller farmers, uh, develop, increase the employment of urban areas due to the, the high migration of people, and also develop other structures to develop the, the countrysides of the world. Here we can see that the, the, this is a graph that shows the increase the production of cereals of the world from 60 to 2005. We can see on the graph that overall the, the food production has increased with along with the increase in population. But we can see here that sub-Saharan Africa they haven't increased as much even though the population has increased a lot. Uh, the result of that, the cause of that, is because uh, this, this part of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, ha use only uh, traditional ways of feeding up with the, with the agriculture, generally requires lots of labor, and they are generally tools, like traditional tools, like the knife and the axe, and um, well, they are not very, they doesn't allow the productivity to increase. The result of that, was that there was a huge uh, famine in 1974 in some uh, parts of Africa and killed thousands of people. Also, there are food shortage during the 80s and during the 90s. So in order to, to try to understand and to, to find solutions for these problems, not only in sub-Saharan Africa, but also in the other parts of the developing countries that has high level of poverty, is necessary to understand the role of the government and the, how the system, agrarian systems work. So it is necessary that the government starts to implement policies and start to take real action in the agricultural system. They need to introduce the poor people into whatever development the agricultural sector uh, experience. To start with, I'll talk about the agrarian systems patterns in Latin America and later on I'll talk about in Asia and in Africa as well. The agrarian patterns in, South, in Latin America is generally characterized, uh, divided in three categories based on the size of the land, which is the latifundus, the first one, which is a large land holdings um, properties which employ at least 12 people, but most of them employ thousands of people. Uh, it is estimated that 1.3% of the, the landowners in Latin America, they hold 71% of the cultivated land in this part of the world. The second category is the mini fundus, which is a very small farm that tends to employ the maximum of two people, generally is, is the a family that would only two people would be working in. And then there are the family farms, the family farms, which generally employs from two to four people and is considered the most efficient of all the three categories. The latifunds are considered very inefficient because the, the owners of the land, they do not see the, own, the, the agriculture as an output to the, to, to the country. They see this as a way to guarantee power and prestige. Also, to, the mo to monitor the cost of these high properties is very high. One of the movements that have been proposed um, a land reform in Brazil is called the, the Landless Workers Movement. 
they try to, they want to divide this latifundus and divide to poor people, especially the people who have been forced out of their lands because of that. Now the agrarian patterns in Asia. The characteristics of Asia is quite the opposite. It is too many uh, people crowded in too little land. Before the European colonization, the system was uh, based on the, the village kind of agriculture where the people would be able to use the land uh, and the chief of the community would allow them to, to, to trade the land, would protect them in exchange of products and services. However, after the colonization, the, the land ownership has been imposed by law, so they created the land loan. So whoever had lots of money at that time would buy large amounts of, of land, but they wouldn't be able to, to cultivate all of it by themselves. So what created was sharecropping, that someone would cultivate the land and divide the, 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 divide the shares of the production. Today, is estimated that 80% of the whole land, 84% of the whole land cultivated in Asia is through sharecropping. Another factor that has been shaping the, the patterns of Asia is the increase of the population. It is estimated that in in a period of one center, in a period of one century, the population grows by three times. So it is very difficult to keep up with the pace of that the population has been growing, which has been caused chronic poverty and money lenders to exploit the situation. Also lending money with high interest rate, causing even more people to, to migrate to the big cities. There is a mistake on this slide, it should say a greater pattern in Africa. So I have a copy and paste and I forgot to change. So the patterns in Africa, uh, the agriculture is generally uh, based on the subsistence. People mainly produce only to provide their family and themselves with food. It is characterized only using traditional tools. As I said at the beginning, it was on the reason technology has not arrived there and it's not uh, developing the country as much. There's, they use shifty cultivation which generally they have to have extra land because they cultivate in one part and they had to, to clear the land after the cultivation to allow it to re regenerate the nutrients. The there is considered to be only one uh, rainy season in, in sub-Saharan Africa and during the first week of the, the rainy season the employment uh, the, the employment is very high, the labor becomes scarce, however all over the, the rest of the year, there is high levels of, of underemployment in Africa. Here on the graph, we can uh, we'll take a look at the first part of the irrigation. irrigation. Uh, the World Bank draws our, our attention nowadays to that saying that is necessary access to technology in that part of the, the world to access of better soil and water. You can see there the first, uh, the first bar that sub-Saharan Africa of all the land cultivated, only 4% 4, 4 of the land has irrigation system compared to the rest of the world. The Europe, uh, developing country has an um, average of 11% and much higher in developed countries. One organization that has been trying to, to develop to highly develop the agriculture in Africa and to overcome the food shortage is called the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa and their mission is to provide uh, food and better uh, agricultural con conditions to small farmers in Africa. Now Pedro is going to talk about the economies. Well, let's, I'm going to come back to the point that Gabriela said just, just now about the sub subsistence, sub subsistence uh, farming that, that uh, as she said, means that the farmer is only producing to feed uh, himself and his family. And uh, the plantation, uh, the, ch the choose of, of uh, which crops they're gonna, gonna plant is, is, is based on what the his family is gonna need first, and then secondly on the market, but mainly on the family needs. D diversified is the, is the is mixed, as you can see, this part, part subsistence and the part for, for sales. 
And the, the transition to happen from the first to the second to pass from subsistence to diversified, uh, the farmer needs, on, uh, needs to have information on, on crops, credit, fertilizers, and also it needs to be secure about risk. Because I'm, uh, as I'm going to explain later, the subsistence farms they have they are risk averse, and the transition to for the specialized that is uh, mostly in develop, developed country, although there is in the developing as well, uh, to pass from the second to the third, you need normally to other sectors of the economy, such as the industry, for example, need to be developed. Now I'm going to talk about the whole of of, of women. Which is which is uh, normally is overlooked, but uh, the women in, in LDC countries they can they can work as you can see up to 80 percent of the of the output agricultural output is responsible is is women's work. You know, although men, men might uh, do the initial work of, for example, cutting the trees and bushes, w women have to go to go there and do all the work subsequent to that, like cleaning the, the trees and planting until harvesting and, uh, and preparing the food for uh, storage or for consumption. And uh, uh, although, although women might work, the, as, as you can see from the, from the 80%, they might work more than men, because men might have non-farming jobs as well, or they can work in the same farm, but they work the same hours or more than men, and they have to, to come back to home and do household tasks because Normally, men don't do that. Uh, normally, for uh, cultural reasons, so they have they have to come back home and do the, the cooking, the caring for children. They have to to, to go and uh, fetch go, go to to bring uh, uh, drinkable water and also firewood for uh, for to, to cook and other and other things. And it depends on the geographical location that we can be very demanding, and they can uh, walk miles. Now I'm going to talk about the, the, the problem of the, as you can see, the, the woman is very important and if, if they account for 80%, it would be rational to think that uh, government programs would be aimed just at men. But that's exactly what happens. The, the programs are, are only aimed at, at men, such as training and, and other things. And uh, when, when women do take part in these programs, they are norm normally trained to perform better on the household tasks and, uh, and also do some peripheral things that are not uh, important. <laughs> and uh, normally programs that tend to improve rural conditions, they, they kind of making the, the gap between men and women bigger. Now I'm going to talk about the, the, the traditional two-factor neoclassical model, why it's not, why it's not adequate. It's because the model is in, in which land is, uh, is fixed and uh, labor is the only viable, viable, viable input. But the, the, the problem with the, with the model is that uh, it assumes that the farmer has a perfect knowledge of the, of the, like the, the, the market. And, that, and that's, that's not true because the, no, the, the, the model assumes that the, the, the farmer will always, will always search for the best method of profit maximization. But uh, what they doesn't take into account is that the, the farmer doesn't have the, the knowledge, the perfect knowledge of new techniques, what input-output ratio is going to come. So therefore, therefore they, ca they cannot, uh, they cannot like, uh, the, the model is not adequate because of that. And uh, carrying on, on that, the price and uncertainty, uncertainty and limited access to credit explains the, the, the risk aversion from the, from the farmers. And explains why the, the model is not uh, is not is not uh, adequate for for farming. And uh, the third point is that uh, because farmers have subsistence farms have to have to feed their families, they don't they cannot take the they cannot take the risk of, of trying to to, in, to try new techniques or new forms of of, of planting that would would in the in the long run um, have a, a, a higher mean per hectare, and, uh, but has a higher variance as well. So they cannot they cannot play with this variance because if if they do that in one year they they find a bad crop or a total failure crop, their family won't be able to feed themselves. 
that, therefore they, they can they can be trapped in this poverty vicious cycle because they can never they can never have money to, to invest. And the, the last point is the is is trying to address the, the, the point above that uh, in order to programs to be successful and uh, farmers to take new new risks or new technologies, the in, you need to ensure that they have security. Otherwise, like a food security and money security, otherwise they, they won't be able to, to take that risk. Uh, sharecropping, as, as Gabriela already explained, is when, when a, a, a peasant farmer uh, uh, kind of rents the, the, the land and uh, they, they decide which output is going to be with the landlord and, uh, and, and the farmer. The, the problem with this, this, this uh, the sharecropping, according to Alfred Marshall, that is an economist, he, he said that the, the, the peasants were only paid uh, part of their marginal, marginal, uh, marginal product. So therefore, they would, uh, they, would, uh, they would not put as much effort as if they were receiving the whole part. So, and... Um, one, the, one economist that argued with that was uh, Stephen Schoen in the 1960s. He said that, uh, that uh, effort was easy to mo monitor, therefore uh, that they wouldn't, be the, wouldn't happen the problem of the farmer not giving uh, mo uh, enough effort because he won't get the money, because the, the landowner could monitor that, that progress and if they didn't agree with the, how, how much or how much effort or how much productivity there was, the, he could change that farmer for another one that would like to, to do the, the same job. So as a result of that, he says that uh, sharecropping can be as efficient as any other form of contract. The third part says that uh, if they say that uh, if you give a, share, a, a bigger share uh, a bigger share of the output for the sharecropper for the peasant that is, is planted and give the security of the land for, for him, uh, productive do, will, will improve because given the reason that he, he will have more marginal uh, uh, revenue to, to him and also regarding the land they're gonna have a possibility to invest in, uh, in other in uh, new technologies and whereas if, if you don't know if you're gonna stay in the land you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to invest because you might leave the next year so if they have this security they they can do that and the, the peasant, when the interlocking factors is happen, when the, the peasant they have to, when they are talking with the landlord, they are they are not only trying to convince him to, to rent him very good uh, areas of uh, arable areas that you can plant on, but he's also kind of talking with the with the guy that's gonna give all the other inputs to them, such as seeds, uh, fertilizers, capital. So therefore, they they are um, let's say. They are very powerful, in that, and that's the, that's are the interle interlocking factors. That, uh, according to, to many studies, the only way to to kind of uh, stop the, this issue, address this issue, is to is through land reform. Quick now, time's up. <coughs> uh, About two minutes. Well, to to improve to improve small scale agriculture. Well, normally what happened in Africa is that the, the way they improved in, in the last decades, they only moved to areas that were not being planted, but there is no scope for that, for that anymore. So uh, the way that uh, it could happen a, a higher productivity in, uh, in Africa, for example, would be to, in, in other developing countries, would be to introduce machinery in, uh, to replace human labor. But that obviously, obviously comes with the cost of uh, a, a Lots of, of works being being lost in, in areas that are already poor and would not cope with that. <coughs> yeah, the fact that that that, that, that these technologies they are uh, they are scale net neutral, meaning that they can be introduced in a smaller and a big farm. But but the problem in, in these developing countries is that the government doesn't act as a scale of nature. They, they give more importance to big latifundios, like big, big uh, landowners. Not that they give more importance, they are more powerful and then they, they demand that, uh, that, uh, 
that that power. So th therefore, to to kind of uh, address the this this issue, the, the government should focus on the small farm and not on the on the big one. And then adapt to new opportunities and new <coughs> new constraints. New opportunities are not only the, the the as we saw from the graph from Gabriel, we saw that there is a, a more planting of cereals now. That was one of uh, one opportunity in the past, but now new opportunities are in more value added uh, activities such as uh, uh, horticulture, aquaculture, and uh, and other niche markets activities such as uh, fair trade or, or organic. And the con constraints are the, the are the new constraints are the I believe the, the biggest one is the pollution and the, again the is a, a bit co not contro yeah, contro controversial or funny that uh, the developed countries are the ones that pollute the most but they are the, the ones that suffer the less and the, the opposite is true for developing countries that they are not polluting but they are suffering more because the small farmers are are suffering for. With, with pollution, they cannot cope. They, can, they don't have the resources to kind of fight that. Let's conclude. Well, let's conclude now with uh, a China, a China lesson to to Africa because uh, uh, Africa is a, is a small farm base agriculture. And the lesson to, from China is that it can become uh, an important force. Is, is, uh, China in 1978, they introduced the, the scheme, the house, household contract responsibility system, that when they start to, to kind of give informal uh, small plots of land for, for, for African, African farmers. And, the, and that, uh, and they were tied with a lot of policies and, and help from the from the government. So what I, what I mean is that uh, is if you if you if you do invest in in small farmers and uh, you don't need to have big uh, large funders to, to be to be important because the to, nowadays the the farm, 200 million farmers in in, in 200 million farmers in China that hold an average of 0 0.65 hectares. So these 200 million, they feed the whole, the whole China, and they have they have only 10% uh, of the they have 20% of the population, the world population. They have only 10% of the arable land to plant, and have only 6.5% 6 of water resources. So the I believe the way the way they they. If they had big farms, they, they wouldn't be able to be as so productive as they are with the small farms. And that's it. Thank, Thank you. you.